Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton. Very early on in Rockdown, our roving reporter, Sharon Love, managed to grab a short interview with our next guest. A few disgruntled viewers sent emails explaining that he wasn't afforded enough time and not enough was asked about his 15 years in the UK. In fact, his standing in the UK far exceeded his dreams, but unfortunately, we in Australia never got the story and never heard about his amazing recordings. When he finally came back to Australia, it was in the punk era. And like all the others, he seemed to have faded into obscurity. But some of us never forget. We sought him out. And finally, here he is, the wonderful Ronnie Charles. Hey, Ronnie, how hey, are you? Hey, Wendy. How Thanks are you? for coming in. No problem. I've got to say, I don't think I've met anyone busier, more organised, or handsome. Ah, thank you. Well, Bert Newton once said you crammed a lot in, didn't you? You certainly <laughs> did. Um, seriously, I'm just <clears throat> going to let you tell the story of where you started and where you are today because, as I said, I literally have not seen as much recordings, amazing recordings that people here in Australia would never have seen. Is that right? Probably not, no. You were a very busy boy. Um, you were born in... In Melbourne, in, in Melbourne, Hawthorne. Yep. In Hawthorne. Yep. Went to Swinburne Tech. And uh, did you meet Russell Morris there? Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, socially, we weren't in the same class. But it was his <laughs> luck, actually, mm. that, um, that he ended up um, even singing. That's right. Because you were poached from... Well, I wasn't poached. I, I, we had a garage band when I was about 16 called Somebody's Image. That's right. Uh, with the members of Somebody's Image, which in, sort of included Russell, really. At that stage, everyone was learning instruments and, uh, you know, wanting to be in a, another band. Yeah. And because uh, it was sort of 1965, 64, 65. And uh, Russell was sort of learning flute, I think, at the time. He didn't and, tell me that. Uh, yeah. And then, because the boys were still learning and I was a bit restless, I actually moved on and joined a band called the Jackson Kings, um, which is where I met Brian Cadd. And uh, I was only in the Jackson Kings for about two months before the group, who, the GRWOP, mm -hmm. who had already had two albums <coughs> with Peter McKeddy as the lead singer, uh, were breaking up. And, and they were well established. And they were well established. But two of the members, the bass player and the drummer, wanted to continue the band and the brand. And uh, they were actually at, at the celebrations to, to, to bid farewell to Peter McKetty at the garrison in, in, in Paran. And the Jackson Kings were on. Ah. And uh, Max Ross came up and spoke to us after, after the, the set or two and said, well, we've had a few ideas, but I think you guys fit fit like a glove. And he was referring to you and Caddy? Yeah, yeah. Because the old group didn't have keyboards. It was a three-piece sort of skiffle, almost crossover from, uh, I don't know if you'd remember their early records, like The Biggest and the Best in Africa. I and, do. And but so well, that, that was, was really, a, that was sort of the, like the, almost a... And the group were hugely successful in Melbourne on the dance scene. Right. So it was a whole different style of music. Yes, yeah, completely different, yeah. So the group then became yourself, yep. Brian Cadd. Yep, Max Ross, Richard Wright and Don Moody. Don Moody. You see, what the group inherited was a very good record contract with CBS and CBS only had one other artist, that was Lynn Randell. And unlike the other record labels, they had no in-house producer. Um, and, I, and I think that Why Woman You're Breaking Me and such a lovely way in particular, still sound pretty good today. It's because Roger Savage uh. did all the sound, did the production, you know, it was sort of a, a joint effort, but he did, he basically, he was in charge of the, the technical Isn't side amazing, of things. Amazing, and right? he produced sounds that, you know, Woman You're Breaking Me pretty much still stands up <coughs> phonically today, as well as any other record of its era. And which is why that record ended up getting played a lot in the States and uh, because of the CBS connection again, the group had, uh, uh, you know, were recognised worldwide. I mean, the group had this little thing here, which was, you know, we made the front page a cash box. Look at that. <laughs> in 1967, and that was uh, 
before we won our trip from the Battle of the Sounds, uh, which was the second, the Twilights won the first one. They went to, to London and came back. And, and then you uh, won the second? We, we won the second one. Was there anything lined up? Well, the only place CBS didn't really have a great setup was in London. So for us to arrive on their doorstep, when really, like you've probably heard this so many times before, we probably should have been going to the States Everyone. as our records were already Everyone being Everyone says that, but in that's all very well <clears throat> in hindsight, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, as far as uh, us or anybody, so the other problem with England is they always tend to treat us as a little bit of a joke in music in those days. <clears throat> and that's why, because they only knew Rolf Harris. And then even in the early 70s, you had things like the Push Bike Song and How's That. We'll take a short break because when we come back, <clears throat> I want to hear how you managed to sort of make your way because mm. it sounds as though a lot of people actually came back very disillusioned mm -hmm. from England. However, something must have happened for you because you went back for a very long time. That's right. We'll take a short break, be back soon with Ron Charles. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My special guest this evening is the gorgeous Ronnie Charles. You're in London with the group. Yeah, 1968. 1968. Mm. So we got over there, and it, as I was saying, CBS uh, were not exactly glad to see us because they didn't quite know what to do with us. Uh, but as I was saying, CBS had other outlets, and uh, Germany we charted with a with one. We had two single releases over there, and it was a song called Nightlife, which was one that okay. never actually got played here. It was mm. a track we recorded just before we left. And was that uh, with Roger? Yes, yes, again, and uh, so th we ended up doing TV in Germany. We we did quite a lot of gigs in London. We were there for 10 months. We were a couple of weeks at the Playboy Club, which is a pretty cool thing to do with uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. upstairs. And uh, Ringo and his entourage came in one night and I saw Ringo's foot tapping to us you know, under the table. And I thought, Ringo likes us, Ringo or likes his foot us. does. And, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, lots of gigs. We went, you know, up north, up and down the M1, did all that. So we had a real taste of it. And, and it there was, was a point, too, wasn't it? There was a point when we were actually sort of going to hang in there, but one of the members of the band got quite ill. It was Max Ross. And he left and actually flew back to Australia with oh, Molly. Because really? Molly was there for about six months with us. And, Acting uh, as what, like a manager? Well, no, he was covering our trip for Go Set and covering the London scene. Oh, right. And uh, and also getting himself and he was at the riots in at Grosvenor Square for the anti-Vietnam thing and made sure he got arrested. You know, typical Molly things has to be in <laughs> in there in the thick of it. Yeah. He went back and we were sort of left with a decision. And we'd actually had management set up there and we were working a lot, as I said, uh, that we could have stayed there. But the lure of coming back to Australia, as the Twilights had done, and cashing in on our trip, seemed and the fact that we had this bell ringing in our head about America, that, well, we could do that and then, <clears throat> you know, possibly then get ourselves organised and get, get over to the States. When we came back, we knew that it wouldn't be very long before the band would probably break up. Okay. So we did another single, which was called Such a Lovely Way, which, which was, which was and great that, and that surprised was us big. and everyone that uh, it did as well as it did. And uh, so we did, to a certain extent, cash in for... Yep. Six months, and then, uh, and then the inevitable happened because Brian had, had had really started getting stuck into his writing with Don Moody, and and wrote things like Arkansas Grass and blah. But that style of music for me was not <coughs> where, where I wanted to go. To go, yeah. And uh, so the band split, and I did a couple of solo records uh, with Festival. And one of those was with the Aztecs, with the original Mark II Aztecs with Lobby Lloyd, and I wow. believe it was their first recording called Natural Man, a song written by Billy Thorpe. What year was that? That was 69. So that was their first recording? Yeah. First in the, st in the studio. Wow. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, then there was that awful record band thing that happened where radio stations weren't playing music here, and I put together a sort of just for the sake of it, uh, a record under the name of Captain Australia <coughs> and the Honky Tonk, which was, you know, the most ridiculous name I could think of. And the the members of that band were the makings of the band that I was taking back to London. And who was in that? And that was a couple of guys from Somebody's Image, 
Um, so I was going sort of back to back my, to my old mates roots. there. And uh, a guy from a band called Aesop's Fables. Yes. And a guy called Brian Holloway. And, I know Brian. Yep. And we went back to London in 1971. He was a Londoner anyway, wasn't he? Well, he'd, he'd only been in Australia five years. So we went back to London and uh, <clears throat> just the, my decision to do that was really based on my experience at 19 being with the group in London in 1968. And I knew one thing and that, that I didn't just want to leave the group and become, you know, start another band or be a solo artist. I wanted to go back there and get stuck into it. And that's exactly what I did. I went back and uh, got a job. Looking at all of these albums. These were done in England. Right? Yes, yes. So, in actual fact... So, the first one would have been the Atlas one, which uh, Atlas was a band which was called Atlas because it contained the two members of uh, from uh, Somebody's Image and myself and, uh, and this English guy called Glenn Turner who was a, a young genius guitar player. And uh, after about 18 months of... And I have to say this as a credit to ourselves because I don't think any other Australian act of that kind, of that time uh, went over to Australia and got a deal themselves. Over to England? Yeah. We got an international so deal. you got the big break. That you an wanted. international deal with Warners, and which was the label we wanted to be with. And through that album, um, even though the album didn't do anything, um, so the what producer, were you called? it was called Atlas. The band was Atlas. <clears throat> And the producer was a guy called Lou Reisner. Lou Reisner, apart from uh, various other things, had just done Tommy with the London yes. Symphony, with Rod Stewart and uh, Peter Sellers and uh, all sorts of people yes. on it. You know, Roger Daltrey, of course. And uh, they were staging it. And the second night, um, one of the characters in uh, Tommy couldn't do the second night and uh, the hawker part and he gave me the gig so I got up at the rainbow with Roger Daltrey and all these people which was terrifying and did this one song which was the hawker's song uh, Eyesight to the Blind is the song and uh, <coughs> Lou must have been impressed because he, he uh, phoned me up about two weeks later and said I've got this idea Ronnie I, want, I can hear your voice doing Leela, and I want to do that with the London Symphony like I've done with Tommy. So, um, so Atlas had failed, and uh, so Lou was offering me uh, the to opportunity do to do Layla. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, as a single, the, the single actually got quite a lot of airplay in, in England, and uh, enough to motivate <coughs> 20th Century, who, who were the the record label to finance this. This is amazing. Can which I, was Prestidigitation, can I, can which can is I, the yeah. LSO album. This is this is stuff. See, this is what kids don't get anymore. That's when right. When you download, and that would tell anyone in the music Who's business that ugly boy there? that they've actually spent a lot of money. <laughs> Did I know him? Because to do a, di a die cut on an album, <laughs> apart from employing the London Symphony, to do an, a die cut like that on an album. Is a very expensive process Absolutely. in those days. Look at that. So, so that, that was kind amazing. of that kind of got my name out there in England, and uh, and and uh, everything was looking absolutely fantastic. And I went to the states to collect visit uh, publishers to get songs for the next album, which would be you know not with the London Symphony, but a, a proper album. In other words, having established the artist, uh, that was the next step. And then Lou Reisner died. Which was, uh, and he was a young man, he was only 40, and oh um, <clears throat> nothing straight, he just died of stomach cancer, and it wasn't that he was a bad boy or anything, it just was happened. just one of those yeah. things. And everything, unfortunately for me, got Fell apart. rather got locked up as well, Demon. until, you know, with, in, you know, normally anything associated with death involves, you know, all, all his assets, all the things attached to Lou were all locked up. These are all your singles from. Well, pretty much, yeah, there's some group ones in there. I've mm -hmm. got the American pressings of the singles and the English ones and the German one. See, this uh, has but been I've my also singles got, there. um, there's, <laughs> the, there's the original single for Layla, um, 
which also has the PAR to in it. There's the, the Atlas thing, and you see the kind of uh, promotion the, the record labels did overseas in those days. I mean, the single just didn't go out cold. It went out with a complete a complete fold-out to promote the band. And, uh, so you have the fun done properly. for people buying um, <laughs> albums <coughs> and singles was, mm. was all of this. Yes. I'm actually in the process of trying to put together using uh, these some of the masters of this stuff into one compilation story. Good. We'll take a short break and be back soon with Ronnie Charles. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My special guest is Ronnie Charles. And Ronnie, after 15 years mm. in England, something made you return to our well, shores. Well, it was the second trip to the States after doing the Ravenscroft album um, with the Rafferty Band. I went over the, back to LA because we did some promotion there for it. was only released in America, that album. And um, uh, it was the second big... And then I was there, the first trip I was there for three months looking for songs. So this is during the time before Lou Reisner passed Did you like away. LA? Um, well, it, yeah, I loved it. Um, after being in London all that time with no sun, I was just down the beach and, you know, just having the greatest time. And apart from, you know, seeing and doing all the things you, that one does in LA from Disneyland to everything else. <coughs> and the music business, I guess I had a little bit of a dirt bogart experience. Is that when I got off the plane, especially that second time, I thought, God, this is so easy. I just forget the feeling I should have done this before. It's yeah. almost like you feel like you're just a little bit too late. And then I came back here and I guess the first couple of months I was just a little bit, it just all felt a bit unreal. It was, I, I had the same <clears throat> affections for the place as being home and, and, and getting back to the sun, which I'd experienced in California and everything like that was, was absolutely brilliant. But I found the music industry hadn't really changed, which is, as I said before. Yeah. And, uh, there wa wasn't really a lot of opportunities. Fortunately, some friends of mine from London, a guy called Danny Beckham and in particular, had moved out here and started doing jingles. And um, it just fitted me like a glove because I found the advertising industry was so much more professional to me in Australia than the music industry. The music mm -hmm. industry was still basically run by promoters and, and, and record labels attached to those promoters. To, to the promoters, yeah. So everything would work in Everything sync. was attached. And I'd sort of reached the end of the fame game. You're very busy. Retro Bandits are a band of guys who are all my ex-advertising mates who we used to sort of get up at the Bonza Bashes and things like that and just for a bit of fun. And then about five years ago, um, the bass player, who's a senior art, direct, art director, you know, who doesn't play golf, said, do you want to do a gig once a month at Elwood RSL with the boys? I said, yeah, it sounds good. It'd be good fun. So if you're interested in finding out any more about Ronnie, <coughs> um, Peter Pan, go to uh, www.rockdown.com and uh, we'll have all of that info up on the, mm. on the website. Now, we're going to go out with a new... A new clip. Well, it's an old, it's an old clip. It's an that, old clip. Um, it was done uh, in London for Wishing Well, which was, as I say, was the feature track from the rec from the London Symphony recorded album. The album. Ronnie, thank you so much, and we're going to take you out with Wishing Well. That's it with the London Symphony. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. See you next week. <laughs> 